Okay. Um, well, now that we officially have a quorum, um, welcome uh, Jimmy and everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So um, I am going to call the meeting to order. I am the uh, vice chair and uh, currently acting chair during this uh, meeting uh, of the Budget Advisory Commission, Anna Brawley. Um, so first I'll start out with a land acknowledgement and then we'll do roll call. So a land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and the land. I'd like to acknowledge that we live and work on the unceded land of the Dena'ina people and thank them for their past, present and future stewardship of the land on which we all live. And with that, I'll go ahead and do roll call. Um, so and if you can remind me, Lila and Carl, if um, if I go through the roll call or if you do. I do. We do. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. You can, if you'd like. Okay. Um, sure. So, um, Carolyn Hall? Here. Uh, Tasha Hotch? Here. Uh, Jonathan King? Not here that I can see. Nolan Clauda? Also not seeing. Uh, Carla McConnell? Not seeing. Jimmy Miner? Present. Um, Alyssa Rodriguez? Also not seeing. And, and she did say she'd be absent today. Uh, James Smallwood Jr. Here. Okay, and then also um, just to state, Lindsay uh, Hobson was not available today, so we do have a quorum. So let's go ahead and approve the agenda. We've got it up on the screen. Um, so can I get a motion to approve? This is Tasha. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second that. All right, thanks, Tasha and James. Um, any objection to approval? OK, hearing none. Um, so just to state also, um, Assemblymember Dunbar said that he would be running late, so I would propose that we go ahead and shift the schedule around, start with uh, school district and OMB, and then we'll slot the assembly update back in as, as available. So with that, I'll hand it over to, I believe we have Andrew and Carl from the school district. OK, uh, thank you. Again, I'm Andy Ralph. I'm the director of the Office of Management and Budget with the school district. Um, give you a brief update and uh, where we're at on the financial side of things. Um, we're still in the process of closing our books as of June 30th. That process generally takes about four months without any sort of, uh, you know, extenuating circumstances. That's you know, generally our process, our timeline to get everything closed out, reconciled, and our statements produced and audited. Um, the other thing we've been going through this summer is our union negotiations. Uh, the board approved our uh, the Anchorage Council of Education or ACE group uh, last two on Tuesday. Uh, that group is generally it's about 465 people and it's got uh, accountants, my budget folks, IT folks, school security, uh, behavior coaches. It's kind of the, this whole uh, kind of group of folks that don't necessarily fall in with in other areas but that contract got approved uh, we still have the teachers union contract outstanding our totem contract which is our secretaries admin assistants uh, and then all the school-based front office staff uh, that contract is going to mediation next week i believe and then we still have bus and food service employees that are out of contract that are in the process of being negotiated as well so on the negotiations front we do have a a busy few months coming up to try to get these contracts uh, settled and closed out because they all expired on June 30th. Um, but other than that, the board really only met the first. This is the first time the board met on Tuesday for the for the since I think uh, June. So um, really don't have a whole lot of news to share with you there. Uh, the only other thing you've probably heard about is the school district's masking policy, which. You know, if Carl wants to jump in and describe the, the masking policy, he's welcome to do that, or I can go ahead and go through that as well. Um, Andy, you're welcome to, to, to go ahead and I'll, I'll chime in afterwards. Great, thank you. So the district introduced or the administration introduced a masking policy that will require masks at all grade levels for the upcoming school year to start off. Um, with the exception of certain instances like speech therapy, you know, IEP, things like that. There will be a few cases where students can't wear a mask or something, but um, by and large, the, the guidance the administration put out was there is mandated masking in schools um, while they're in the building. If they're out on recess, masks are 
are going to be optional. Uh, the same with sports. But that's kind of the underlying things that the uh, administration went. And then there's the all the, I think online, if you go to the ASD website, there will be a link to all the, the, the safety protocols and things like that. They're going to be in place at the schools. But that's really my update. Um, if you have any questions, happy to take them. I'll let Carl jump in if he has anything to add to the mask policy. OK, um, thank you. And just to say, I, I'm not seeing any questions, but a reminder to the members to just raise your hand or um, use the chat function and I'll, I'll recognize you as, as they come up. So go ahead, Carl. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so yeah, Carl Jacobs, um, school board member here. Uh, pleasure to be with you folks uh, again this month. Um, I don't have a ton to add outside of what Andy covered. Um, uh, what I'll say is, uh, is something that, uh, that hit home yesterday. Uh, I guess it would have been the third on our meeting. Um, is that the plan that's in place that ASD is implementing really is comprehensive and, and more than just uh, masking. And so um, I think the board at, at, at large felt comfortable with proceeding forward with what was recommended. Um, going back to financial aspects, um, the uh, finance committee of the Anchorage School Board is meeting uh, for the second time uh, since the, the board reorganized um, later this month, I believe April 18th. Those uh, those meetings are televised too. Um, those are that's kind of what are the only things I had to add, and then I as well am open to um, questions or if there's feedback I can take back to the full board by all means. Okay, thanks, Carl. I'm not seeing um, any folks with questions, but um, but I'll give uh, people a chance to think for a minute. In the meantime, I had just a, a real basic question, which is um, I know the. The municipal budget is on the January to December fiscal year, and um, and so we're you know we're looking at get running into that process pretty soon. But um, is the school budget on the same cycle, or is that on the state fiscal year cycle, which is July to June? We're required to operate on the state fiscal year of July to June. That's in that's a statutory requirement. Okay, thanks, Andy. And I'm still not seeing any questions, um, so let's go ahead and move on unless I'm not seeing any pop up. So let's go ahead and move on um, to the OMB report and thanks to our school district folks for joining. OK, great. Could you put another slide? So on uh, so we're right in the middle of the budget, uh, beginning of the budget meetings in next two weeks from uh, August 9th through the August 20th. The part we have been receiving from other departments feedback uh, to, to the proposals for 5% decrease. Uh, the actual meetings will start happening next week. On August 3rd, which was Tuesday, we sent out an email requesting of the departments uh, additional information as to improvements in efficiencies and effectiveness in any uh, possible automation uh, implementation with new uh, software systems and if they would need any resources in the future. Um, so that's what you're seeing right in front of you. Since um, we only had our meetings you know, a couple weeks ago, I have nothing further to add at this point. OK, um, thank you, Carl. Um, I see Carolyn's hand raised, so go ahead and ask a question. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you, Carl. Um, uh, I'm, cons I'm wondering what the timeline is for um, sharing the tr transition report. Is there an update on that? You know, I haven't heard yet. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, because this is a new administration, there's many moving parts and uh, priorities shift basically minute by minute. So I would love to get you more information, but unfortunately I don't have an answer at this time. OK, thank you. Um, any other questions from members? Oh, Carolyn has another one. Go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm curious. Um, is there any update as far as what the administration's approach is with working from home or allowing um, certain departments to work from home? Has there been any shift with that? Um, reason why I ask is due to the increase in COVID cases. 
Thank you. No, I understand, understand about, but this question more relates to uh, human resources and their, you know, their responsibilities and policies and city manager uh, uh, running day to day city operations. Unfortunately, I would love to answer that question, but. OMB, we are strictly focused at this time on getting through the budget period, making it as efficient as we can for the people of, of, of Anchorage, and, um, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? I'm not seeing any in the chat. And as you said, we did meet uh, recently and we're still all waiting for, um, you know, our, our part of the budget uh, process to begin. So um, I understand there's uh, just a very brief update. OK, so from there, um, let's move on. So we have two informational reports today. Um, one is from uh, Treasury with Dan Moore. Um, just a, an overview of the uh, uh, revenue that that we've been collecting for 2021 and, and uh, possibly the projection for 22. And then we'll also hear from um, Jack and is it Gadamus? Gadamus? Um, anyway, I'll, I'll get that confirmed. Um, on it's Gadamus. You pronounce Gadamus. it. Gadamus. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, to do a property appraisal report. So I will uh, turn it over to Dan Moore with Treasury. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you very much. And um, my name is Dan Moore, I'm the city treasurer. Also with me is Paula Ricewig. She's sort of the second in command in Treasury. Um, we have been trying to work as much as possible uh, in the recent weeks on the revenues, uh, mostly focused on where we are with 2021. Um, at this part or this time of the year, uh, we're right on the point of knowing a lot more. Uh, so what I'm going to present are just a few highlights from uh, from information we gave to the assembly um, a week or two ago. And this also went to the assembly officially on the 27th at their last meeting. So if we go to the first, uh, the second page here of this handout, on this page, uh, this is multiple pages. I'm just gonna give a few highlights is we, um, we tried to look at sort of the big picture at where the 2021 revenues were uh, at a snapshot point in time. And so we were able to do this right around mid July and we looked at what the total budgeted revenues were for general government, that's the 100 funds. And this also does include our contribution to the school district. So the grand total budget for 2021, you can see it in those three bullets above the uh, chart, is $802.8 million. Uh, the year-to-date actual posted revenues in our SAP system, uh, $619 million. So basically, uh, we are 77% realized revenue through about mid-July. Uh, when we compare that realization rate to where we were a year ago in 2020 for the same time period, we are slightly ahead of that. So the good news there is just that we're not missing or lagging in any big way of uh, the posting of our revenues. Um, that does not tell the full story because each revenue is different in terms of when it gets posted and kind of how much we well, on the first page uh, of this matrix, there's two different revenues here, and this is a classic example of where we have two very uh, economically sensitive uh, revenues, rental vehicle tax, room tax. They're driven by, of course, tourists and business travelers. Um, so in this case, both of these revenues are quarterly. They're not monthly, they're quarterly. And at the time we ran this in mid-July, we did not have the second quarter data uh, to know really where things stood. Um, so we only had, in terms of posted revenue, 12% and 10%. So you'd say, uh, and in the further columns to the right, we say, well, we expect to you know, actually exceed budget for room tax and for rental vehicle. And you might say, well, you know, how, how could you possibly say that with so little posted? Well, the good news is that a number of years ago, the assembly approved a uh, change in municipal code that required the larger hotels, it's about the top 20 or 25, to provide their monthly information filings. So we know how much taxable room rents occurred in the month of May, and we can compare May of 2021 to May of 2020. And of course, May of 2020, 
was a very hard hit month due to COVID. Um, the whole year overall for room, room tax and rental vehicle was uh, down about 56%. Uh, so there was a lot to be recovered uh, in 2021 and future years. So anyway, based on what we saw in May, we could tell that there is a strong uh, demand and strong pricing in both rooms and rental vehicle. And we are ahead of target by quite a bit. Uh, and target being we assumed when the budget was set, we would have a halfway back recovery in 2021 versus what life was like before COVID. So uh, we are more than halfway back. I can't give you an exact uh, update or whatever uh, at this point in time. We did get second quarter filings, most of them. Um, and I'll share with you just, uh, this is the verbal comment here, but as a verbal comment, um, we think we're going to have a continuation of second quarter uh, and we're talking the revenue variance is going to be positive for room tax. It'll probably exceed a million dollars for this year over what was budgeted um, and rental vehicles, a smaller budgeted amount, but uh, it'll be hundreds of thousands of dollars more than what was budgeted. So that's generally where we see 2021. When we look at 2022, which is, you know, far out there in the distance, uh, we are actually being asked by OMB to try to estimate 2022. And right now, at this moment in time, it looks like 2022 might be 10% better than it was in 2021. And that's for room tax and then 8% better for rental vehicle tax. And uh, that's, again, based on uh, trends that we're seeing. And uh, we're trying to be a little more on the conservative side. It's been very, very strong, but we also know that pricing is uh, particularly high due to the demand. So the pricing is going to come down, uh, we expect by next year. In, in the big, big picture, the tourism industry is expected to recover. At least it'll take at least two to three full years to fully recover. So uh, so we, it's it's a long haul. So anyway, that's uh, that was a lot more attention to that. The rest of the pages here, if we go to the second page, I'm not gonna get into all this you know, elaborate detail here because of your time. But uh, but these are all the different taxes that we, we collect in Treasury. And uh, I'll say tobacco tax is a tough one to predict. It's very volatile. Uh, it's a $20 million tax, so it's quite quite a large budget item. Uh, so we we think we'll be close to budget, maybe within 500,000. Uh, marijuana tax continues to be quite strong. Uh, the, the amount of uh, consumption and purchases in 2020 during COVID was very strong and it continues to grow, not only in terms of demand, but also just number of operators. Uh, the aircraft tax is very small. It actually is going away. The assembly approved last year uh, a full deletion of this particular tax. And so, uh, so that will be uh, completely phased out by 2022. Motor vehicle tax, this one is uh, driven by, uh, uh, I keep using these puns, I apologize. Uh, it's, um, it is influenced heavily by uh, people's, uh, you know, travel, you know, uh, tourism, but also people coming to work or staying remote. Uh, and there was a major, major drop last year uh, in this but we uh, follow whatever the projected rates are by the Federal Energy uh, Agency. And so for 2021, uh, we are exactly on target with what was budgeted. It's about an 8.3% recovery over 2020. And for uh, the next year, it's gonna be another 5% or so recovery on top of that. So that one will recover um, slowly, but faster than room tax and rental vehicle tax. Auto registration tax, uh, this one we actually expect to exceed budget. And that is really, as everyone I think knows by now, the number of new cars and used cars are, the supply is very, very low, demand's very, very high, and prices are way up. So how that affects this is uh, people with older cars that were getting the lowest possible registration rate have uh, likely upgraded to a newer model car. And because of that, their registration tax uh, goes up accordingly. Uh, private pilt. Uh, this is a uh, this one changed a lot, and I'm actually have a question out there. I won't be on this one to get a little more information, but uh, I believe this one is driven by the sale of MLMP to Chugach Electric, and so uh, MLMP used to pay what you call a MUSA payment, which is a municipal utility service assessment, and that has been now replaced uh, or substituted with what we now call private pilt. So, uh, so I believe that's the primary reason why that budget went up so much between 2020 actual and uh, 2021 budget. 
Um, the, the remainder here, mutual assistance is a big question mark, but the budget has been brought down significantly. Uh, so there's less at risk in terms of what the legislature and governor finally do. The real property tax uh, has been billed, it was billed mid-May. Uh, it's on target. Uh, it's very close to what was assumed when the mill rates were set. Uh, usually within um, you know, 500,000 to a million dollars, uh, variance plus or minus is pretty normal. Personal property tax, this is on the next page. This one is one of the big unknowns, at least it was at the time we looked at this a couple weeks ago. Uh, we did since uh, then bill out the timely rolls, uh, uh, timely personal property rolls. So we have a good sense of what the what the bulk of personal property is going to be for 2021. And unfortunately, it's going to miss the mark in terms of what was budgeted uh, at the time mill rates were set. And this one is extremely difficult to project. Uh, I think when you hear from Jack Adamus in a minute, uh, he'll comment on what what sort of drove the variance of this particular tax. But uh, it is going to be off the mark by at least several million dollars. So it's uh, it's our biggest negative uh, that we know about at this point. Uh, APD counter fines, traffic enforcement, you may have noticed, has gone up quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of grant funded enforcement going on. So those revenues we expect to exceed budget. PFD garnishment, a huge question mark. I believe in the month of August, the legislature and the governor are supposed to try to come to a final decision on that. Right now, I think technically the BFD is budgeted at zero. Uh, we assumed a, a PFD of about $1,000, uh, right at $1,000. If we were to get uh, no dividend, whatsoever this year, it would be a $4.2 million negative hit. So we're hoping that doesn't happen. Um, ambulance service fees are uh, uh, kind of in a state of flux uh, with how they get reimbursed. And uh, so that that budget keeps getting adjusted quite a bit year to year. Uh, we don't really have a good, good read on what that might end up for 2021. Uh, last page here is on cash pool earnings. Uh, that's for basically the cash pool investments the city has. The budget was brought way down because interest rates have come way down. Uh, this one is probably going to be uh, fairly close to budget, but it can really be volatile month to month. And you really don't know exactly how the month of December will end up because that's really the final marking point. The trust fund, this is a great story. Trust fund falls under treasury. Um, the dividend used to be 6.5 million. Uh, now it's 18.7 million. So it's triple. Um, and it's actually going to go up another 400,000 next year. Uh, this is directly due to $229 million of new money going to the trust fund. Trust fund went from 170 million to 200, almost 290 million today. It's 340. 330 some million, I believe. Um, it is really, really grown a lot due to the uh, large increase in the market and just the infusion of new money. So uh, this has been a very, very helpful thing for the city. It's a form of investment income. It's outside of the property tax cap. And uh, it's it just uh, came in in a very strong way to help help the budget. Building safety fund, uh, we're still waiting for some information on that. So far, they look like they're on track with their budget. Alcohol tax, this is where Paula Ricewig is most involved with her group, is a brand new tax for the city. It started February 1st. Uh, the budget is at $11.8 million. We're collecting about $1.1 million on average, uh, a little over a million on average per month. And so uh, we expect to meet that budget and probably exceed it by a few hundred thousand dollars. And uh, next year will be a full year of alcohol tax, and that budget will probably go up to 13, 14, 15 million, somewhere in that range. Uh, we're still working on that number. So that's the uh, update on the uh, on the revenues that we provide to the assembly with a few extra current, uh, current updates on top of that. The remainder of this handout is just all the detailed revenues line by line so that uh, if you were curious about any particular revenue, you can, you can see the actual uh, change. The last, uh, so the second handout I had, and I'm really not going to cover this in much detail at all, but I just want to make you aware of the group, the commission, aware of this in, in case you haven't seen it before or haven't really looked into it in depth. This particular document is required every year. Uh, OMB produces it. It is very, very full of lots of information. It's very helpful, both on the, uh, in terms of revenues, expenditures, and outlook. So for Treasury, we're asked each year by OMB to provide some commentary on the revenue part. And under Chapter 3, which is about three pages back, um, if you keep going, yep, there it is. Um, I'll just highlight a couple things from here. And, and those earlier pages, I just want to make sure you're aware that what this document is that I'm referring to. So I gave you the title page. 
I gave you the preface, which talks about the purpose of it, and then title and uh, table contents, just so you know uh, what all is in the document. But but I'm only I only took a few pages here uh, to just highlight. So the first page uh, basically shows you a chart which shows how close we are in terms of budget and actual revenues year to year. So over the years, the uh, the refinement of budget revenues has become very very strong, and we are very much uh, on top of where the revenues where we expect them to be. There are some variances uh, some years just due to surprises or things that are outside of our control, but it's very rare that uh, we don't know something is coming and we can't hopefully plan for it. In general, revenues have increased about two and a half percent on average annually. 88% of all revenues are subject to the tax cap. So uh, most of them are under the cap. Uh, room tax would be the big exception. And, and now alcohol tax. Uh, alcohol tax is tracked in a separate fund, so it's not a 100 fund. It's considered a part of a 200 fund series. Um, so the only other part on the bottom of this page, uh, we look at revenues just to try to give a perspective here in terms of major categories. And so uh, those categories are listed and you flip to the next page. It lists all, I think there's six different ones. So the first one was mill rates, which is the big one. Second one is residential consumption, resident consumption, economic conditions, state government, state or federal government, and then um, enforcement driven uh, code actions, and then anything that's unique. So uh, if we go to the next page, uh, they'll show you, a, this is a, a pie chart, which shows those same categories. So you get a sense of what is the biggest. The biggest is, of course, 71.4%. Those are revenues driven by mill rate. That is not just property tax. That is also MUSA and MISA payments that come from the regulated utilities. So, uh, so that is the biggest piece by far. The second biggest piece is going to be to the right to the left of that, which is ta uh, revenues determined by consumption uh, by local residents. And that would include uh, fuel, marijuana, uh, tobacco, now alcohol, uh, so those those are those types of revenues. And then there's others that are very much more economically sensitive, like building permitting, tourism, things like that, room tax, rental vehicle tax. And those are some of the other pieces of the, of the pie. So um, if we keep going here, and, and just uh, one thing just to put, uh, I think I have this at the tail end here. Yeah, I do. I'll, I'll come up to it in just a moment. Uh, so on the next page, this is showing you real property uh, and kind of what the trend has been. And what I think is interesting here is the chart on the bottom half where it shows kind of what the long term growth has been for real property. There's a lot of discussion about property taxes and, you know, how, how strong they grow, how high they are. Um, but ultimately, if you look at a very long term trend and you take into account inflation, it really is only about one and a half to two percent is what it's been running year to year on average. So that's uh, that's the trend for real property. On the next page, personal property. This one, again, Jack Adamus is going to talk a little bit about personal property in a moment. But you can see by this chart at the top, it is it is a tough one to predict. It is always up and down due to the economy and just due to lack of information. Now, these are businesses that file after the mill rates have already been set. And it's really, a, it's truly a guessing game sort of, you know, we do our best uh, to try to make educated guess, but we don't know until businesses actually file their returns uh, what, what's gonna end up for the tax. The second half of the page, you see the actual uh, the growth or inflation and adjusted rate of growth for personal property is actually flat to negative. So, uh, so this is not an area where uh, you know a business would say, "Oh, my taxes keep going up and up and up." They are actually uh, you know very much kind of held held at a, a pretty flat rate. So, they also do have a, an exemption that helps a little bit. There's a twenty thousand dollars exemption on the first. Uh, $20,000 of taxable value. Okay, the second, uh, the next chart, and I am really close to being done. Thanks for allowing me the time. Uh, the second chart is showing these resident taxes. Now, this is very dramatic. So if you look at the early years, 1998, back then we had like room tax and maybe tobacco tax. Uh, we went, and this is this is staggering to me because actually I've been here the whole time, okay? In, in 19, I started in 1999 in Treasury. We had about $10 million in taxes. There were two or three of them. In 2022, which isn't shown on the chart here, we're going to get to $100 million of various taxes that are not property taxes. They're all these other kinds of taxes, what we call self-reported program taxes. So we are going to be tenfold what we, what we uh, started at when I started in Treasury. So it is extremely dramatic. And you can see by the chart how much these taxes have grown in terms of the variety and, and what they bring in. These all help to reduce 
uh, property taxes. So they are, uh, except for alcohol tax, which is going to be outside the cap because that's what the voters approved. Okay, so that's that. And the last page, last two pages are uh, just showing the percent growth in these resident taxes. You can see instead of one and a half to two percent, it's actually uh, about four, four plus percent per year. Uh, the second half uh, chart here, you can see when it comes to fees and for services charged, it's actually very flat. Uh, last number of years, so that really hasn't grown at all. And then the last page uh, shows the dramatic drop off of tourism taxes. When you look at 2019, which is an, was an extraordinary year, normally we were getting about 27, 28 million per year from say room tax. 2019 was 30, I think 31 million. It was, it was way up. It was an extraordinary year. And then we went from that to COVID, the COVID year. So it was, a, like I said earlier, about a 57% decline. Um, so that is the conclusion of the highlights I had. And again, thanks for allowing me all that time. Yeah, thank you, Dan. This is um, very informative. So I'll um, again uh, recommend members use the raised hand function or put uh, questions in the chat. And I see Carolyn has a question. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. And Dan, thank you so much for that really thorough presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, first, though, um, Travis, I apologize. I, I believe I misspoke and called you Carl earlier. So <laughs> sorry about that. I was looking at Carl's name uh, on the list of participants. But Dan, I have two questions for you. You mentioned an infusion of funds into the uh, trust fund. Is the is that from the sale of MLNP? And then what do the dividends that kick off from that, do those pay for municipal services? What happens with those funds? Thank you. Okay, so I, your, your voice broke up a little bit, but I, I think I heard it. Uh, so the trust fund, uh, the market value of the trust fund increased uh, uh, in late October last year from about 172 million to um, it was 290 million. And that was directly due to the net sale proceeds from the sale of MLP to Chugach Electric. The actual trust fund, the MOA trust fund, is like an endowment, like you might see at a UAA or something, right? So it is a, or it's, a, it's basically like a mini permanent fund for the city. The difference is we don't pay out dividends to all the citizens of Anchorage. We we maintain that fund and we pay out a big lump sum dividend each year to general government. And that is considered an area-wide fund or area-wide uh, revenue that is uh, has sort of maximum flexibility in terms of how it's used to help pay for government services. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, and I'm not seeing other questions at the moment, um, but I have, uh, I guess, a couple. So I'll <laughs> I'll ask one, and then I'll I'll just keep an eye on if anybody else has questions. Um, so one is just uh, you you kind of alluded to it, but um, you mentioned the overall change in basically what residents pay other than property tax having gone up. Um, and that most of that has basically been property tax relief or under the tax cap. So, um, so do you? I guess do you see that that if you looked at both of those together, is it basically a wash, or is it um, if you add in maybe some of those other things outside the cap, is it like would you generally say that our um, tax burden has gone up or down or flat? Um, I mean, it's going to really depend on the individual and kind of what their lifestyle is, uh, but. Um, it is true that if if most of these taxes, which they are, are under the cap, that when one dollar of say tobacco taxes is, is raised, that means one dollar less of property tax is needed. And so, if you happen to be a property, if your profile is you're a property owner and you smoke and you uh, you know maybe drive your car a lot and you do all these various things. Um, then uh, you're going to uh, see the benefit both positive and negative, and it will be more of a wash. Uh, I think where the biggest source of revenue is, is sort of the weighted average, so to speak, is if you're a property owner and the value of your property has gone up, right? And then of course, like with uh, school debt reimbursement, things like that, uh, you are going to end up paying more, uh, more through your property taxes than you are through any other type of taxes. So, uh, so if I so I'd say the focus would be uh, mostly on after all the wash effect of the different taxes, what does a person end up paying uh, additionally from year to year on their property taxes? I think that's where it sort of speaks speaks the loudest. Okay, thank you. Um, others have any questions? 
Not seeing any at the moment, so I, I have a couple more, so <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, another one was you mentioned the uh, APD counter fines. So I was just curious, um, did those go, are those dedicated to a purpose? Do they go into the general fund or where do they end up? Yep, that's a good question. Uh, so APD counter fines, those are the, uh, just so we know based on the reason, way that the nomenclature is, that means that the uh, person has received a traffic citation and they have gone to APD uh, either in person or by mail, or by internet, and they've paid that fine in a timely, ma timely manner. So for those uh, traffic fines, they were issued by the police department and the revenue goes back to the police department 100%. There is also a, a major effort that Treasury does every year on the PFD garnishment, and uh, probably 90% of what we garnish is on behalf of police department, either tra delinquent traffic fines or delinquent criminal fines. And all of that money that gets garnished, and this year it's budgeted about $4 million, all of it goes back, well, I'd say 95% of it goes back to the police department. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll again see if there's any questions. Um, double checking the chat, but I'm not seeing any. It does say Carolyn's typing, so I'll give it a second. Um, so Carolyn asks, where does the other 5% go of that you were estimating in the PFD garnishments that go back to APD? Okay, sure. Yeah, so there are a few miscellaneous where we do some restitution garnishments. So in the days of MLMP, if someone were to knock down a light pole, uh, they would be ordered to pay restitution. So we would garnish for that. The money would then go back to MLMP. There's also some areas like indigent defense, where a person cannot per, you know, provide their own lawyer for their case. And that is actually an area-wide service that is managed by the law department. And so we reimburse the law department uh, for any type of indigent defense costs. But that's really where the miscellaneous 5% comes in. Okay, thank you. And I have uh, one more question and then I'll, again, keep an eye on if anybody else uh, chimes in. Um, I guess partly a question and a comment. Um, so I was, uh, I'm, I'm personally very interested in the alcohol tax revenues, and so I appreciate the updates. I know it is a new tax. I know you guys have uh, plenty going on right now, but I did notice that the um, that there isn't a, an equivalent type of report online yet, the way that you have for the other program taxes. So, so I guess my question slash comment um, is, you know, are are you going to be publishing that information? And um, and then the comment is just to encourage you to do so. Okay, uh, that's uh, actually is a little off my radar because it is so new. It's been a tremendous amount of effort to get that thing going uh, up and running. But I believe in Paulus here, I believe our intent would be to eventually do that uh, once we have a little bit more history to actually put out there. So do you think that's correct, Paula? Is that the plan? Yes. Yeah, so we will be doing that probably more toward the fourth quarter this year once we have more, more data to put out there. So, uh, yeah, we will for sure. It, I, I think... All those different types of taxes, I think all, all of them, we, we publish data to really let uh, the public and the industry know kind of what, what the typical uh, levels of incoming revenues are for each of those taxes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've definitely looked at the others and um, just as a member of the public, so it's always interesting to see, um, especially uh, you mentioned the increase in marijuana tax, and I know that that was a trend over the last uh, few years uh, as the industry matured, but also as demand seems to have gone up. So, yeah, as demand and also some of the products they sell are uh, higher value. They're more specialty type products, and the pricing is quite a bit higher. And those have become, I guess, fairly fairly popular. So, yeah, yeah. But we will make sure to get that posted later this year, and that that was a good suggestion. So, thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, and again, I'm not seeing any any other folks jumping in with questions. Um, so, and I, I had a question about personal property tax, but you mentioned that Jack will cover that. So I will propose that we move on to our next presentation. And thank you again, Dan, for um, for the information. It's always very helpful. So Jack, you're up, and I believe we'll get your presentation uh, sorted out as well. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I have a. It'll be reasonably quick, but I'll be happy to take questions with everything. Dan did talk quite a bit about, um, let's see here, I'm trying to share my screen here. Dan did talk quite a bit about personal property, so um, we should be just, oops, trying to 
get my, uh, there it goes here. Um, so this is looking at our projection here. This is what we do. And so this is generally what we give Dan and his team to just compare what our projected uh, original projected value is and then compare it to what the projection is now, uh, largely a time in life. Um, again, Dan was talking about real property here, looking at that. Generally, we were pretty close on almost everything. Um, when we do the projection, we do the first quarter revi revisions for the for the tax year. For this year, obviously, this is the 2021. Uh, we have a the real properties really short up. The the big ones when we do the projection that are really questions is going to be appeals, and we do have some questions on exemptions too. Just just with that. Um, other than that, um, we. Uh, we were pretty good in that. Um, as you can see, taxable, and as Dan's already mentioned, um, we were pretty close with the real property projection coming within a two and hundreds percent. So we were very, very, very lucky on that one. A um, couple of things that's interesting, and I'll talk maybe briefly about this or allude to it when we start talking about the 2022 projection, is the senior exemption you can see the the senior exemption senior disabled veteran we have about 2.8 almost 2.9 billion dollars of uh, exempt value in that that's $150,000 uh, off of the first um, off of your assessed value as far as that would be exempt um, we're seeing that just increasing uh, year over year almost uh, increasing at an increasing rate so um, very interesting there uh, the other thing I want to mention maybe that might be interesting is this appeal section here. Um, it's about $100 million uh, that we expected and came very close to that for our appeal loss. We had a, re a, a very modest appeal season for residential, but a very heavy appeal season for commercial. So commercial did really appeal a lot more. Uh, the advantage of that is we just we did get gain a lot of information from property owners. That's always a helpful to to know that as the assessments are a reiterative process every year. Uh, so I thought that was very interesting. And speaking of businesses and everything, moving on to personal property, we can maybe just take a look at that unless we have any questions with uh, real property. Yeah, thanks, Jack. So uh, first, I'll just um, acknowledge that Assemblymember Dunbar has joined uh, the meeting and I'm not seeing any questions currently, but again, folks just use the chat or use the raise hand function. So personal property, we projected about a 2% reduction back when we were looking at this, as Dan Moore was, was alluding to. It's a rather volatile property type year by year. And we just have, we know very little at the time we we projected, but we projected a, like I said, a 2% reduction. We were expecting some closures and some reduction to inventory. At the end of the day, you can see really we're going to be down um, right now. We are expecting to be down overall about 5.86%, so almost 6%. Right now, as we stand, we have the timely role so people who file timely uh, that role is out and we are down significantly again about six percent we do have a late and involuntary as well um, that will be coming in october we're projecting that to be very similar about down six percent from that um, and so uh, yeah projections are either lucky or wrong why are we wrong this year I, I think it really just we identified again that people are going to reduce their inventory we also identified that there were going to be some closures but we just didn't project the magnitude that really started to happen a um, couple of trends that we were seeing is is just the number of closures uh, we're expecting um about the number of closures this year compared to last year to be up about 14%. Last year we had about 616 
closures overall, we're expecting to see about maybe roughly 700 closures. Um, so that that's certainly something. A lot of these the, the shops, um, especially maybe the, some of the smaller ones, uh, closing. The other thing that we found to be interesting is that businesses that did keep their doors open uh, significantly reduced their, their inventory. Inventory for, for personal property um, is down about um, almost 8%, 7.5 something percent. Um, the other thing that was also interesting is that other assets such as um, you know, your either your short lived uh, lived items such as like your computers um, and then maybe your longer lived items that maybe are, you know, last 10 years or longer, such as maybe machinery and equipment. Both of those down there are, are both of those are also down um, about six and a half percent. Um, very similar. So people are reducing their inventory at the higher rates than than before. In addition, people are disposing of their assets, whether it's a short lived item or a long lived item um, are, are disposing that. So that's been very interesting um, from from those. So those are really the two big trends that have really largely driven this uh, larger reduction than we anticipated. Um, the, the last and, and final thing maybe to mention is that the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, um, that also took a downward dip this last cycle, and that did impact our assessed value um, from that. Uh, we are seeing, you know, coming, moving forward, the CPI and inflation is obviously ticking up here a little bit, but um, for last year, for the tax of 2021, that's what we're seeing. Moving forward, so I, I believe you're asking maybe just a, a brief thought on 2022 with, with us. Again, I think the exemptions for the for the uh, senior and disabled veterans for 2022, we're going to again going to expect that to increase probably at an increasing rate. Also, it's been, I'm sure you've heard it in the news more than once, but the real estate market, the real estate housing market is uh, going crazy. If you look at MLS right now, MLS is, is showing a 8.3% increase in the average sale price for residential. I doubt we'll increase our values by 8%, um, but certainly upward movement. As far as the business sector goes, the commercial we're, we're probably expecting to have a reduction in that, just given some of the information we've had seen in the appeal period. In addition, or in conjunction, personal property will probably expect a continued downward trend. I don't know what magnitude we're going to see. We're working on this projection right now. And then finally, what's also been interesting and I know a lot of people focus on this, but taxable new construction. Uh, we don't have the numbers now. Generally, we pick up new construction towards the end of the year in November, December. We just want to be mindful of that January 1 lean date or snapshot. But right now, what we do know with new construction is permits are down. Uh, they're about 85% of what we saw last year. There's just not many projects. There's one hotel that's coming in that is often C Street, 30, C, C Street and 36. Um, I think right now what we're seeing residential for new construction is, is reasonably stable, but again, nothing really in the commercial side where the, that's usually the bulk of the value for things. I'm sure you've heard the cost of building materials is, is increasing. Interest rates have, at least for a little while, been slightly increasing. And um, that's generally what we're kind of seeing right now. So hopefully that helps with some of what um, gives you at least a little glimpse into our section. OK, thank you, Jack. Um, so uh, again, I'll remind members to raise your hand or, or post in the chat if you have a question. And I'll just start out with a pretty simple question, which is, uh, what are some examples of personal property tax? You know, you mentioned business inventory. It said oil and gas, but what, like, what are what are maybe the top five examples of that? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest is going to be inventory. So if you go into 
your local cars or Fred Meyer, basically anything that's on the shelves is going to be inventory. So anything that's not not fixed to your real property is going to be can be inventory. Another good example would be like furniture furnishing, like furnishing and fixtures. For example, your hotels. A large chunk of hotels is personal property. So you go in a hotel and you got your bed, you got your nightstand, you got all these other things, all personal property, um, you know, not part of the hotel. And uh, of course, you got your machinery and equipment is going to be a big component of that too. So, um, so in general terms, personal property is really anything that's not permanently affixed to the real property, to the building is generally for that. And this is for businesses. We don't tax personal, personally owned items. And the other thing to know is, Dan already mentioned it, there is a $20,000 business exemption. So the first $20,000 is exempt. So that alleviates a lot of very small shops, mom and pop shops. They don't have to file with us just because of that $20,000 business exemption. So hopefully that helps maybe clear up any questions on what personal property is comprised of, but there's a whole list of things. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Um, do other members have questions for Jack? And I'm not seeing any in the chat or raised hands. So um, I think with that, we can let you go. And then, of course, if we do have any questions, we can um, uh, ask members to follow up in writing. Thank you. So thank you again for your presentation. OK, so let's move on to our um, actually returning to uh, Item 5A on our agenda now that we have uh, Mr. Dunbar uh, in the meeting. So if you can please provide assembly report. Oh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, great. Um, you know, I don't have much to report uh, since the last um, time we met or the BAC met. We've had one budget hearing since then and, and spoke more with the administration. But actually, no, you know, I take that back. I think you got your your hearing was actually slightly after that one. So we haven't had another budget um, hearing. We have one coming up, I believe, next week. Um, perhaps the week after, uh, you know, they are they are going through their budget process now and we have not received any additional uh, documents. Um, we did hear we did have the um, confirmation hearing for the OMB director, uh, Carl uh, Ruskowitz. I, I have to learn this. I apologize to Carl. I, I will I will learn. I will be able to, to say his name soon um, and uh, and we'll be having a confirmation vote on him on Tuesday. But other than that, um, no major updates from the assembly. OK, thank you. And just a reminder to our uh, BAC members that the Budget Advisory Commission does give a very brief update to the um, the Budget and Finance Committee on a monthly basis and that um, they're all public meetings, so uh, folks are welcome to attend those and stay in the loop. And I imagine also um, will be welcome at any assembly work sessions throughout the fall um, for the budget. So with that, um, let's move on to audience participation. I don't see anyone who is an audience member, but just checking if there's any members of the public who would like to participate. And not seeing or hearing any, so let's move on to our next item, uh, BAC open discussion. So um, I have just a few updates um, that Lindsay and I had a chance to touch base. She was uh, regretful she couldn't join the meeting today, but um, just a few kind of things for the schedule. And then I'll also open it up to uh, any member comments before we uh, before we close out. So in terms of what we're looking at for the rest of the calendar year, um, we are uh, looking at doing one or more budget work sessions. Um, and so that would be in October, probably around mid-October. Uh, we didn't uh, want to set a date yet for that. Uh, just, you know, we'll, we'll do that closer to the time, but that will be um, after the budget is officially released um, around October 1st and then before um, the formal uh, public hearing and approval process with the assembly. So uh, keep a lookout for that. Lindsay did remind me that this group last year um, had several work sessions because there was ARBA funding. There was there was just a lot of um, pieces in the queue, so we don't anticipate that level of an intensity this year. But of course, we'll be um, watching that closely and, and we can schedule as we need to. 
Um, the next thing again is just to remind uh, folks about the uh, assembly budget committee meetings and fall work sessions. Um, so I won't uh, reiterate my notes too much there. And then uh, two other pieces just to have on people's radar. Last meeting we talked about our department reviews um, and we're looking at getting those scheduled and those are uh, something that the budget advisory commission has done for the last few years. Individual members meeting with department heads to learn um, you know, learn what they do, learn what the components of the budget are. And so um, Lindsay and I did meet with uh, OMB Director uh, Carl and talked about that schedule. And I know he is very supportive of, of this and, and continuing that tradition and um, and and having those meetings, um, you know, not just for us to learn, but also so that he can um, kind of have a chance to touch base with department heads outside of the the budget cycle process. Um, but we also talked about the timing of that. So we're looking instead, instead of this year, looking at uh, early 2022. So once we're past the budget cycle and past the holiday season, um, and just knowing that many of the directors are, are new to their jobs and still figuring everything out as they have to write a budget for next year. So um, so we're gonna look at that, uh, getting those scheduled, and we'll, we'll reach out to folks in the next few months. Um, but again, getting on the other side of, of the immediate priorities right now. And then the last thing to say in terms of schedule is um, that uh, in the past, this group has done strategic planning. Um, so a chance for, um, for the members to get together, to get to know each other a little better and um, come up with what we see as, as priorities or um, areas of inquiry for the next year. So I haven't gone through that myself and I know there's a, a couple other new members um, who haven't gone through that process before. So I'll, I'll defer to um, our longer term members if there's if there's other uh, thoughts on that. Um, but tentatively, we would look at doing that sometime in uh, January or February. And then of course we would work with um, with OMB folks to get that scheduled. Um, and, and we'll see if we'll able to be able to do that in person or if we're still uh, doing virtual meetings, but um, but either way, we'll, we'll be following up on that as well. Again, once we get past the budget uh, for this year. So with that, I will open it up to the floor to see if there's other member comments, um, things you'd like to hear at future meetings, um, concerns you'd like to share back with the administration, kind of any anything you'd like to say um, as in this last portion of our meeting. Oh, Tasha, go ahead. Thank you. Just thinking about the strategic planning session that you mentioned, um, I've been to a couple of those now, and I think it was a really good process for us to talk about what things we as individuals would like to see the Budget Advisory Commission do, as well as have some collaboration from staff and the assembly on what their priorities would be for us. And then we um, put together, I think, like a top six list, I think being realistic about what we're able to accomplish in the timeframes that we've um, set aside to look at um, the municipality budget. But I think that it's a great um, thing for us to do. The way we've done it in the past is Lila has sent out a doodle poll and we actually take, um, it's like a five hour uh, meeting that we have I think in the past done at the library, we've also done it at the fire station, but we have, you know, snacks for breakfast and then a lunch and it's a work session that usually goes from like nine to two or three. And I think that that's been really a good productive use of our time. Thank you. Thanks, Tasha. That's that's really helpful background. And, um, and I agree that does seem like a really great uh, conversation and way to um, think of, think ahead about our, our role for the next year or so. Um, are there any other questions from members or comments? Oh, and just to note, uh, Tasha mentioned that there was an outside facilitator for the meeting, um, which is often helpful because it gives a chance for the people participating in the meeting to um, to not be managing the meeting at the same time. And let's see, I'm not seeing any other comments in the chat or questions. So I think I think unless unless there's others who want to offer thoughts, I think we can adjourn a little bit early today. 
Um, so I'll just remind members, uh, I know we had two meetings pretty close together, uh, just the scheduling worked out that way, but our next regularly scheduled meetings will be the first Thursday of the month, so September 2nd, October 7th, uh, possible work session, like we mentioned, in October, and then uh, November 4th. So that's what our schedule is uh, for the time being. And also, I'll just uh, ask if if Carl or anybody else, you have any closing comments or or notes for us before we adjourn? No, thank you very much. Wonderful meeting. I'll have more updates as we roll go through the uh, department meeting process, and uh, we'll we'll have more information for you next time. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Then, if there's no more, uh, oh, Carolyn, you had your hand raised real quick. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, so Carl, I'm so sorry. I believe I caught. I was trying to correct on on the record what I thought was your name, and I'm so sorry. I was thinking I was um, chatting with somebody else who was in the room. So I'm wondering for the next meeting, and Anna, if you and Lindsay would be okay with it, Carl, would you mind including an introduction of yourself so we can get to know you a little bit better? Would that be okay with the group? Sure. I mean, I can do it. Um... Actually, it's, this is a perfect time. Maybe I can introduce myself. I've been with the municipality almost 11 years, and my previous boss is sitting right next to me, Dan Moore, and my direct supervisor, Paula Reiswick, which she's off camera. She's also with us in this room. So I was a uh, field tax auditor. We have many achievements in the Treasury um, that dealt with uh, specialty taxes, as Dan talked about. It was kind of nice to hear those one, wonderful words that I worked on for many, many years. And, um, you know, I have an MBA, I have a degree in economics, and I completed accounting. And um, I feel honored to be uh, appointed by the by the mayor to this position. And I look forward in, uh, you know, working with you guys. So I think that that's, that's probably brief. And as time goes on, we'll get to know each other more. And, uh, life moves on. I so appreciate that, Carl. Thank you so, so much. Sure, no problem. It's just, I've been a public servant serving the people of Anchorage for the last 11 years. And, uh, and I'm very, very thankful for this appointment by the, uh, uh, by the new administration. Yeah, thank you, Carl. And it looks like um, we have Carla McConnell joining um, just at the end of the meeting here. Um, so Carla, just so you know, we're on uh, uh, open discussion, basically, if there's any um, closing comments or questions from members. And we just heard a little bit from uh, from Carl. So I'll also say, uh, I apologize that we didn't think to put that on the, <laughs> on the agenda and introduction um, of you, but I'm glad we had time to do that. And I'll also really encourage um, the BAC members to uh, first to go listen to your confirmation hearing. Um, I didn't listen to it in, in real time, but I did have a chance to catch up. And so I really appreciated just that that opportunity to hear more about your background and and um, your experience as an auditor. And um, and yeah, I think it was a really great, um, great and, and brief way to get to know you. And also to say to members that you should definitely feel free to reach out to Carl. I know he's got a lot on his plate, as does Lila and the whole team right now. But um, but Lindsay and I did have a chance to meet on Monday, and it was really great just to have a conversation um, in person and to get to know you a little better outside these these meetings. So um, so as your time and schedule permits, I would encourage folks to to reach out as well. And it looks like we're also joined by Jonathan. So just to say we're, we're wrapping up the meeting a little bit early today. But um, Jonathan, Carla, or anybody else um, who would like to make any kind of final comments, I'd, I'd welcome that before we adjourn. Uh, I apologize for my lateness. I had a 9.30 that didn't start until 11, and so we'll blame the client. So um, apologize for missing 99.9% .9 of the meeting. No problem. I'm glad to have you here. And Carla, I don't know if you have any uh, closing comments or just want to um, just want to sign off for the day. OK, um, well, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Carla said she can't unmute. Let me see if I can do that. Or maybe Lila. Are you able to unmute? 
We're working on it right now. OK. And I just posted in the chat um, uh, Carl's confirmation hearing the link to his hearing. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe Lila, you could also send that out um, as a follow up after the meeting. But for those who are in the meeting, uh, that's available in the chat as well. Oh, Carla's just saying that that she uh, had a mix up on the time. <laughs> um, no worries. We we had a good uh, informational presentation, but Lila will send it out to the whole group um, after the meeting. So. So I think with that, then I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. This is Carolyn. I'll motion to adjourn. Asha, second. OK, thank you. And with that, we are adjourned and we'll make sure that the calendar is uh, up to date for next time. Thank you.